In this lecture video, we're going to learn about voltaic cells. Voltaic cells are devices that use redox reactions to generate electricity. In the context of thermodynamics, spontaneous reactions that happen can do work on the surroundings. And this is also the case for voltaic cells. So one of the first things we'll talk about is the spontaneity of the redox reactions that can happen. These figures show an experiment that we can conduct to see which of these metals, zinc or copper, will transfer electrons to each other's salts in a spontaneous way. And so we have copper and zinc sulfate dissolved in water, and they are in the plus two oxidation state. And the copper plus two is a nice blue color, and the zinc plus two is colorless. So we can set up these two different experiments where the copper metal is immersed in the zinc plus two solution, and the zinc metal is immersed in the copper plus two solution. Now hopefully you can see that in this image in the middle, there's no redox reaction. But in the one on the right, you can see that the zinc metal has become much darker. To better show that a reaction has taken place, Here's an image just after the zinc metal was submerged in the copper plus two solution. And then after a lot of time, you'll notice that the copper plus two color has faded in the speaker, meaning that the copper plus two has reacted away. And then this buildup of metal on the zinc is actually copper metal. And you'll notice that it's also deteriorating the zinc where it's submerged under water. And so the reactions shown in the equation form are that for the middle beaker here, copper plus zinc plus two has no reaction. But zinc metal plus copper plus two does give copper metal. And because of that electron transfer, we must also balance that with the formation of zinc plus two ions. And so this reaction as written is spontaneous in the forward direction, but not spontaneous in the reverse direction. As we will learn later in this chapter, metals can be ranked by energy with units of volts. And the potential difference between zinc and copper is 1.1 volts, where zinc is indeed lying at higher energy. What that means then is that if we compare zinc and copper metal, zinc is a stronger reducing agent than copper. And we can also think about when reducing agents give up electrons, they form their metal ion counterparts. And comparing zinc plus two and copper plus two, we can think about these as oxidizing agents. And now the reverse is true. The copper plus two is a stronger oxidizing agent than zinc plus two. One way you might reason this is that zinc plus two as an oxidizing agent has to gain electrons to reform zinc. And so if zinc rather give up electrons, then it's going to be much harder for zinc plus two to gain electrons to reform the metal. This complementary relationship between the reducing strength of the metals and the oxidizing strength of their metal ions is very similar to what we saw in acid and base chemistry, where the stronger the acid, the weaker its conjugate base, and vice versa. The weaker the acid, the stronger its conjugate base. So we can think about this top redox reaction as really a reaction between a reducing agent and an oxidizing agent to form an oxidizing agent and a reducing agent. And just like before in acid-base chemistry, the direction of spontaneity is such that the stronger pair will form the weaker pair. The flow of electrons is often compared to the flow of water. So here's a cartoon of a waterfall with a specific height h. And waterfalls can do work on their surroundings. So we can add this water wheel and thereby convert potential energy into mechanical energy. 
Now let's say the water wheel was originally at the bottom of the waterfall. Then we would be able to extract the maximum amount of work because of the larger potential energy. However, if we were to move the water wheel halfway up, our potential energy would be halved and therefore the amount of work would also approximately be halved. The same is true for metals and their potential to transfer electrons. And so halfway between zinc and copper is nickel metal. And so just like an analogy to the potential energy differences, the transfer of electrons from zinc to nickel plus two is approximately half the potential of transferring electrons from zinc to copper plus two. And so if we were trying to extract work from these redox reactions, we would get approximately double the work from transferring electrons from zinc to copper plus two compared to zinc to nickel plus two. So how do we add something like a water wheel to our spontaneous redox reaction such that we can extract work from the system? And the answer is to make a voltaic cell device that as a cartoon is shown here. In the voltaic cell, a spontaneous redox reaction is being performed, but in two separate chambers. So here, the half reactions, the oxidation and the reduction are essentially separated, but the transfer of electrons is allowed through this wire that connects the zinc metal to the copper metal ion and by something called a salt bridge between these two solutions. Because of the spontaneous flow of electrons from zinc to copper plus two, if these two metals were connected by a wire, then we would see a flow of electrons or electricity being generated where the electrons originate from the zinc metal and flow towards the copper side where the copper plus two ions can be reduced to copper metal. Now, if we were to insert a little light bulb in this wire, we can actually see it turn on, being powered by the electrical energy that's generated through this redox reaction. An electrochemical cell is a device that can either use a downhill redox reaction to generate electrical energy, or it can use electrical energy input to drive an uphill redox reaction. There are two kinds of electrochemical cells. The first kind is the voltaic cell, which is sometimes also called the galvanic cell. And the other type is the electrolytic cell. Now these differ by whether the redox reaction is spontaneous or not. If it is spontaneous, like in the voltaic cell, then that means the redox reaction can do work on the surroundings. If it's not spontaneous, like in the case of electrolytic cell, then you need the surroundings to do work on the reaction such that it can proceed. So in the example between zinc and copper, then the spontaneous direction could power a voltaic cell, but the non-spontaneous reaction could be performed if done in an electrolytic cell where there was a power supply driving this uphill reaction. There are key applications for both kinds of these electrochemical cells. As we'll see later in the chapter, all batteries are voltaic cells. For electrolytic cells, an important process that uses them is electrolysis. This is a process where metal ores are reduced to extract the metal element. The rest of this lecture video will focus on the voltaic cell. So first, let's go over some key parts. The first key part of a voltaic cell is called the half cell. These are the two chambers shown here where the half reactions are physically separated from one another. Now, the next key part is the metal electrode. And usually these are electrical conductors. These two metal electrodes have two different roles. One is called the anode, where the oxidation occurs, and the second electrode would be called the cathode, where the reduction occurs. One way of memorizing whether the anode or cathode 
corresponds to the oxidation or the reduction is to realize that both anode and oxidation begin with vowels and cathode and reduction both begin with consonants. The next key part is the solutions inside the half cells. These are filled with electrolytes, typically ions, that can also conduct electricity. And the last key component is this glass arc called the salt bridge that's packed with ions and yet can allow ions to exchange. So this arc basically connects the two half cells and completes the circuit. So one of the problems is that as you have spontaneous electron transfer from one chamber into another, you start to build up negative charge in one of the chambers and positive charge in the other chamber. And so to maintain charge neutrality in these half cells, basically charge ions can move from one chamber into another through the salt bridge. Here's a voltaic cell of the reaction we discuss where zinc metal spontaneously reduces copper plus two ions. So we have our two half cells where oxidation and reduction are physically separated. We have electrolyte solutions of zinc sulfate and copper sulfate. We have our metal electrodes, zinc and copper, that are connected by a wire. And finally, the salt bridge that connects the two half cells. So because zinc is undergoing the oxidation reaction, we would call the zinc electrode the anode. And because copper is where the reduction reaction occurs, the copper electrode would be called the cathode. Electrons are being generated in this left half cell and being used up on the right half cell. And so the electron flows come out of the anode and move towards the cathode. That means then that the charge on the anode will be negative because zinc is losing electrons and the electron buildup here causes this charge. On the other hand, the charge on the cathode is positive, and that's because the electrons are being used to reduce copper plus two, creating this positive charge. Another way to think about this is that electrons being negatively charged will spontaneously flow towards positive charge. And so that's another way of remembering that the positive sign should be on the cathode. As electrons are flowing, we also are doing chemical reactions where zinc metal is being depleted to form zinc plus two ions. So that's creating a surplus of positive charge in this left half cell. On the right half cell, copper plus two is being reduced to copper metal. And so we have a deficit of copper plus two. And that means we have an excess of negative charges from the sulfate counter ion. So this is where the salt bridge comes into play. The salt bridge will help maintain charge neutrality by moving that surplus of negative charge in this right half cell towards the left half cell where the negative charges can charge balance the formed zinc plus two ions. So sulfate ions can then flow up from the right to the left through the salt bridge. The salt bridge also has other ions present inside. And so for instance, oftentimes there's a sodium salt. And one other way of counterbalancing this charge neutrality is to have the plus ions move out of the salt bridge into the side that needs it. So you can see why the salt bridge is described as completing the circuit because we can think of the movement of the negative charges. So electrons are being moved from left to right in this top part of the circuit. But once we get into the second part of the circuit, it's the negatively charged ions now that move from right to left, creating this nice loop such that electron flow can continue. This image of the voltaic cell can be represented simply by an expression called the voltaic cell notation. And this is the outline of what that notation would look like. They would have different chemical species separated by these lines. 
The double line in the middle is representative of the salt bridge, and the salt bridge physically separates these two half reactions. Typically, the oxidation or the reaction at the anode is listed first, and the reduction or the reaction that happens at the cathode is listed last. In each of these parts, the reactant and the product species are separated by a single line where the reactant appears first. So in this voltaic cell, we have zinc metal at the anode being converted into zinc plus two product. And on the cathode side, we have copper plus two reactant being reduced to form copper metal. These cartoons are zooming in on the redox reaction that's occurring at the surfaces of these metal electrodes. Now these lines here would represent the original surface of these metal electrodes. And at the anode, the zinc is being lost to form zinc plus two ions, which dissolve in solution. So as the redox reaction takes place, the zinc electrode would look more eroded. On the other side, at the cathode, copper plus two ions from the solution are being reduced to form copper metal atoms that would then build on the original copper electrode. And so physically what that means then is if we were to let this redox reaction run for a long time, we can actually see the depletion of the zinc electrode and the growth of the copper electrode. In some cases, we don't want our metal electrodes to be changing so much physically. And so we can actually replace these with what are called inactive electrodes. These typically are made of graphite or platinum metal. And generally, they transfer electrons, but neither the carbon or the platinum atoms are actually involved in the redox reaction. And sometimes it's really necessary to use inactive electrodes, for instance, when you have reactants that aren't amenable to serve as an electrode of themselves. Here's an example of a voltaic cell where we're using two inactive electrodes, graphite, in each of these half cell reactions. So at the anode, we have iodide ion being oxidized to form I2. Even though I2 is a solid, it's quite brittle and not suitable as a physical material for an electrode. At the cathode, permanganate MnO4- is being reduced to manganese 2 plus ions. Now, both of these primary redox species are aqueous or solvated in water, and so therefore they are also unsuitable to act as a physical electrode. Here, the two carbon inactive electrodes are necessary to allow these two half reactions to work in tandem in a voltaic cell. The cell notation becomes slightly more complicated because we have to indicate the presence of these inactive electrodes. But like before, we have these double lines in the middle, which represents the salt bridge that separates the oxidation reaction from the reduction. In the oxidation reaction, we begin by listing graphite, the inactive electrode, that's then separated by a line to the reactant and the product, I minus and I2. On the right side, we have the reduction reaction indicated, where we list the reactants per magnet and also the presence of protons. Then the product that's separated by a line, manganese 2 plus, and then a line that separates the inactive electrode graphite.